What's going on YouTube? Welcome back to the Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football Channel. It's your boy Nick here. First off, I want to say thank you to our sponsors, Monster, as always. And as always, I'll tell you that they're not actually our sponsors. But Monster, if there's anyone from there, anyone who knows that works there, fantasy football is a great industry for you to get into marketing. But I digress. Today, we're going to get back into another team outlook. We hit the Giants in the first one, and we hit the Redskins in the second one. We're going to continue down the NFC East and hit the Dallas Cowgirls and see what they have in store for us in the next fantasy football season. If you're not following me on Twitter, I'll have this link below the entire video, probably Twitter, subscribe to the blog, all that good stuff. I want to make these videos a little quicker. So without further ado, let's get to the numbers. All right, so when you start with the Cowboys, you obviously have to look at the rookies they had last year, starting with Dak Prescott at quarterback. A ridiculous season, the AP Rookie of the Year. He blew up the fantasy scene as well as the NFL scene. Finished as quarterback six in fantasy, and that was despite being 23rd in pass attempts and being on the NFL's most run-heavy team. They ran the ball in 48.7% of their plays last year. No other team matched that number. That can only mean one thing, that he had ridiculous efficiency. Not too hard behind that line, obviously. He went 23-4 and four in terms of touchdown-to-interception ratio, and he did that with a banged-up Dez for like 40% of the season. Cole Beasley was his guy. Anytime Cole Beasley is the guy in the offense and you can make magic, I think that says something about you as not only a player, but a fantasy stud. When you're looking at Dak, maybe you're thinking like, oh, it's a lot of dump-offs, a lot of easy throws, a lot of these like stat-piling kind of uh, shoots that, that he's throwing in there, right? But that's actually not the case. Dak's average depth of throw was 8.6 yards. It's not crazy, but it's, it's, let me see, I have the stats written down here. So it was guys like Matt Ryan was at 8.9. Andrew Luck was at 9.0, so there's only, it's very minuscule difference in terms of the average depth of throw. So it's not like they're all short passes, dump offs from the running backs or anything like that. That's slanging the ball. When you look at that type of efficiency, you know, you're always going to see red flags. And there are going to be red flags going into this year with Dak. Um, it doesn't mean regression, but a lot of the signs point to regression. It's almost impossible to keep up a 23 to 4 touchdown to interception ratio unless your name is Tom Brady. The biggest change to this offense is that they lost Ronald Leary on the line, and they also lost Doug Free via free agency, via retirement. Flip that for the two guys, respectively. And they didn't go out and, and make any big signings to kind of cushion up that line. They're going to be moving Lyle Collins from tackle to, or from guard to right tackle. So there's going to be changes there. The, the, I know that like those two guys weren't absolute studs. They were good players for sure on the, uh, on the later end of their career. But that continuity is something that builds up and is, is a huge game changer. It's one of those intangibles that you really can't put a price on. So that's definitely going to shake up the offense a little bit, which, which makes me a little nervous. The second thing, and I went back and looked at some numbers. So Dak had six rushing touchdowns last year, right? He tied for the NFL lead with quarterbacks with six touchdowns, um, with Tyrod Taylor. And that number I don't think is sustainable. So I want to, I want to spew off this number that I found for you guys. The only QBs over the last 16 seasons, so going back to 2000, that have repeated back-to-back -back seasons of six-plus rushing touchdowns are Cam Newton and Tim Tebow, the young baseball god. So when you look at the history, when you look at the stats, it's not in favor of Dak repeating those rushing numbers, to say the least. But it's not all bad. There's plenty of room for positive regression as well for Dak. He ranked 27th in red zone attempts with 52, 20. Fifth in attempts inside the 10 yard line. And he posted a 14 to 1 and a 9 to 1 touchdown interception ratios in those areas. If they're going to attempt to throw the ball more down there, which I would expect given that Des Bryant's back and he's an elite red zone target, those numbers, you know, there's room to grow. So even if he has a little bit of regression in terms of more interceptions or less rushing touchdowns, I would think that he has more attempts near the goal line there. So, you know, Dak's still a, a stud safe play there. You know, all in all, I do think Dak is a super safe play as as a, as a no-brainer, like low-end QB1. I'm still taking all the big names before him. I'm still taking even guys like Cam Newton, Russell Wilson before Dak. But luckily, the way fantasy football works out, you don't really ever have to make that decision. Dak's going right now is QB14 at like 104th overall. So like, I don't know. It's it's almost not worth talking about these guys because you could just get them so late. But Dak's an, another late round quarterback that I absolutely love this year. Okay, so enough of Dak. Let's move over to the wide receiver position in Dallas. You have to start tunnel vision. Ooh. 
Uh, you have to start with Des Bryant. You know, I talked about him a lot in the mock drafts that I did recently. He, he was good last year. He played in just 13 games, uh, and he was top 12 in both fantasy points per snap and per opportunity, meaning um, targets or carries. Obviously, he didn't get carries, but you get the point. So when he got the ball, he did well. Um, unfortunately, like I said, they're they're a very run heavy team, so it's 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 unlikely it's going to be a crazy amount of targets his way. But over the last two years, he hasn't even been a top twenty fantasy wide receiver in either of those seasons. Like I know what you you could say what you want about talent, injuries, all this kind of stuff, but if you're not gonna play and if you're not gonna live up to a top twenty wide receiver, I don't really want you on my team as a top twenty overall pick, let alone wide receiver. So here's something I found very interesting. Actually, I went back. And I used uh, the Rotoviz screener or the Rotoviz game split app. Let me show you where this is at. This is really cool, so you can check this out. Rotoviz.com. Let me see if you can see the URL. Slash game dash splits. And what you can do is like put in uh, players' names and things like that, and get splits with someone who's played with someone else and the numbers that they had in those games. And that's what I did with Dez. I went back and looked at Dez's stats with. Tony Romo, you know, I'm comparing him to a Dak, I guess, because they're both competent quarterbacks, if you want to say. So I went back and looked at when Tony Romo took over as the quarterback in Dallas back in 2006, and here's what I found. And they played in 97 games together in that span, and Dez averaged 4.7 receptions, 68.3 yards, and .69 touchdowns per game. That's about 15.7 PPR points a game. In almost every case, that leaves him as a low-end wide receiver, too, in fantasy. In PPR leagues, at least. He's going to be a little more valuable in standard because he relies pretty heavily on touchdowns, not so much receptions and yards. But what I'm saying is, you know, he gets a lot of unwarranted hype. He had that one really, really, really big fantasy year, I remember, because he had so many touchdowns. Uh, but... Like I said, the, the splits with Tony Romo don't really lie. He's not in every he's not in every week stud. There's a bunch of guys I would take before him. You know, I just think the offense limits his ceiling in terms of targets and receptions. He had four or less receptions in eight of the 13 games he played in in 2016. Just kind of been like the theme of his career. I feel like when you're watching a Dallas Cowboys game, Dez disappears for like quarters at a time. Like before you know it, it's the fourth quarter and he'll have like a two for 13 line, right? And you're hoping on a late touchdown or something like that. And that's not the kind of shit I want from my first, second, even third round pick. So obviously the touchdown upside is there. Of course, I'm not throwing that out the window, but um, he's going at pick 18 right now, I think, as wide receiver 10, which is, I think, pretty fair. I know people, uh, some people have commented on the videos and said they'd like, you know, they'd be cool with Dez as like a, if they're at like the snake end of the first, second round, pair like an AJ Green with a Dez. I'm not reaching that high for Dez. I would take a lot of dudes as a wide receiver position before Dez. I would actually take Doug Baldwin this year over Dez. And I think the Dez versus Amari Cooper debate is a very good one. I would probably lean Dez there, but I'm going Doug Baldwin over either of those guys. That's my take on Dez. So playing opposite of Dez is Terrence Williams. Just re-signed to a four-year, $17 million contract. I'll take a, the hardest pass here. Um, I don't want anything to do with Terrence Williams. I don't get why anyone like ever drafts this guy. He literally has no ceiling whatsoever in fantasy, and his floor is terrible too. Like there's no upside with Terrence Williams. Since he answered the league in 2013, his average fantasy finish has been wide receiver 51. And then uh, Cole Beasley, we got obviously the little slot guy over there. Shocked he hasn't ended up in New England, to be honest with you. He kind of had a little career year last year. It's his, it was his fifth season in the NFL. He racked up a 75. 833 five touchdown line, which is pretty damn good numbers, uh, especially in PPR. And he finished as PPR wide receiver 32. So a, a legitimate wide receiver three. Obviously, he's a high floor, low ceiling kind of guy. And uh, I would throw him in probably the same rankings that he finished last year, probably a little worse than that. So he's like a, a mid to low wide receiver three in PPR. I think having Des back obviously hurts him a little bit. He didn't have a single game above 75 receiving yards, and he scored three of his five touchdowns in the three games that Des was on the sidelines. So he took advantage of those opportunities, and uh, those definitely inflated his numbers a little bit. I think he's a good player for sure, and I think he's someone that will contribute in this offense. I want to look at his ADP versus... Okay, so Cole Beasley's going 170th overall, wide receiver 65, and you have a guy like Jamison Crowder going wide receiver 33 at pick 70. So 100 picks earlier, you can get Cole Beasley for free. And I don't think their stat lines are going to be that different, to be honest with you, at the end of the year. I like Jameson Crowder. I think he's more talented, but there's so many more weapons in that offense. Cole Beasley is basically the second weapon in the offense as a receiver because Jason Witten's getting old. Terrence Williams sucks. So 
I, I like Cole Beasley there over over Jameson Crowder as a as a value play. And as I just mentioned, there's no one else on the wide receiver core I really like. I mean, I, we could wait for Bryce Butler. He got re-signed to a one-year deal. I don't, you know, there's not room for him to really do anything unless somehow Terrence Williams gets hurt and he takes over as a full-time wide receiver too. Still don't see any upside. I don't see any fantasy value there. I'm not drafting him. But we'll move over to tight ends. Obviously, Jason Witten been in this league for too goddamn long. I'm, I'm legit tired about writing about him every year. Uh, he signed a new four-year contract this offseason with Dallas. It literally contains no guaranteed money in it. Literally none. So that four years doesn't mean anything. His contract is not guaranteed past 2017. So his numbers in 2015 and 2016 were super similar. Um, he, he'll probably repeat around the same numbers, if not take a step back because of his age. You know, he's just, you know, he ain't nobody beating father time. When you look at the end of the year, you start looking at the overall picture, right? You look at the overall rankings you're like oh wow Jason Witten finished in the top 12 to 15 but on points per game basis he's been pretty terrible over the last two years um at least in PPR leagues he finished as tight end 25 in 2016 and tight end 20 in 2015 so he gives you like this really annoyingly consistent floor I guess if you want to call it but there's like 15 to 20 guys I would rather take than Witten with more upside and probably just as high as a floor so I'm good on Witten you could say what you want about his overall finishes but he's not good on a on a points per game basis especially in PPR leagues and last up we'll move over to uh the running back situation with Zeke and there's not really much to say here Zeke is to the Dallas Cowboys what like Tito's vodka is to every 20 something year old like there's no other choice. There's no other option. The head coach Jason Garrett already came out, said there's no change in game plan. He's going to keep feeding Zeke like he did last year, which we saw worked to perfection. He had over 1,924 yards, 16 touchdowns, his rookie season. Uh, and in a lot of years, Zeke would, without question, be the number one overall pick in fantasy drafts in the upcoming season. But we have David Johnson, we have Le'Veon Bell there, so he's not. I do think the switch to the offensive line is going to shake it up a little bit more than people are expecting it to be. Like I said, I'm a big advocate of how continuity plays into things. So with Zeke, top five consensus pick, without a doubt, any style of draft, PPR, half point, standard. Um, but he is a step behind guys like Le'Veon Bell, David Johnson. For that reason, he's not as involved in the passing game, and the line switch up kind of makes me a little nervous. Overall, top five, I ain't going to be mad at you if you take him like two or three. So that wraps up the Dallas Cowboys outlook. This was an easy one. They don't have a lot of stud players, which is perfect for me. Hope you guys enjoyed. Please give it the thumbs up if you did. Share, subscribe if you're new to the channel. If you have any questions, I actually want to hear you guys. What are your thoughts right there? Des Bryant, Amari Cooper, Doug Baldwin. Rank them for 2017. Half point PPR. Rank those three guys. Who would you take first? Who would you take last out of those three? Like I said, I'm going Doug, Des, Cooper. Go follow us on Twitter. Everything will be linked below or linked right here. Go check out the blog. Subscribe to the newsletter. The draft guide will be coming out in mid-August that I'm working on. It's an e-magazine that you'll be able to purchase right before your draft with top 250 rankings, sleepers, bust, basically all the videos I'm putting together kind of compiled into one little e-magazine that'll be super cheap for you guys to purchase if you're interested. And that's really it. And we got the, the big dogs got to eat dad hats coming in soon. They'll be in in like two or three weeks and they'll be up for sale if you're interested. So you got to be styling out for the summer, boy. And I'll see y'all next time. Thank you for spending your time with me. It's much, much appreciated. I love you guys. How to give a fuck about Your time expired, you're driving me to drink Now I'm running little